Hello, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Candidate Interviews. Uh, today we're sitting down with candidate for Secretary of State, Sarah copeland Hansis from Bradford. Sarah has been serving in the Vermont House for 18 years, most recently as chair of the House Committee on Government Operations. And full disclosure, Sarah and I served together for five years when I was in the House from 2012 to 2016. So I'm excited to have Sarah with us today. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank uh, you. You're running for a statewide office now. Uh, were you were you surprised by the primary results? Um, I, you know, I knew that it was going to be a close race. A lot of the places that I went to during the primary, you know, I would talk to people and they would say, you know, honestly, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to vote, and uh, I really like you and what you what you stand for and what you've worked on over the years. So I wasn't terribly surprised that it was close. Um, it was uh, it was a, by and large. Uh, a really good civil campaign. You know, I talked about myself, my opponents talked about their strengths, um, and, uh, and I, in that way I thought it was uh, a really great uh, first statewide campaign. So for those who don't know, what is the main role of the Secretary of State and why do you want the job? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's four main duties of the Secretary of State um, and probably dozens of smaller duties that uh, the people wouldn't necessarily interact with. But the most high profile, of course, is elections. We, um, we oversee elections statewide. We support the local uh, town and city clerks in conducting elections. Um, and we, uh, we operate the campaign finance website and lobbyist disclosure websites that uh, that folks use. Um, the s probably second place that that uh, Vermonters most frequently interact with the office is through the Office of Professional Regulation. So this is um, any any occupation that requires a certificate or licensure, and the the real focus of the Office of Professional Regulation is to try to figure out the lowest uh, barrier to entry um, that will uh, serve the purpose of protecting uh, public health or public safety. It has to have a compelling public interest. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, we're not licensing people simply because, you know, a group of um, professionals got together and, and wanted to require a license for any new people coming into their profession. Um, and so in that way, uh, the Office of Professional Regulation is really always looking at ways to be more efficient uh, so that someone moving to Vermont from outside of the state or outside of the country can, can you know, have a streamlined way to, to get their license or their certificate so that they can practice in Vermont. Um, the third um, division of the Secretary of State's office is the State Archives which is a really exciting um, uh, place if you stop and think about it. It is the recording of, uh, of all of the records of the state of Vermont. Um, and of course, back in the day, they were, they were on paper, and now, of course, they're more digital. So we've got a lot of uh, new uh, and evolving skills as we figure out how to best hold on to those records of what Vermont is and how the decisions were made and and uh, and what uh, you know what the government did on behalf of Vermonters um, in a digital realm uh, and then last but not least is uh, is corporations and so if you start a corporation you uh, you have easy access through our business portal to link to the tax department or the Department of Labor or any other place within state government that you might need um, a certificate or uh, or ID number in order to operate. Um, the corporations division is uh, is responsible for uh, you know the corporate trade names of you know some thirteen thousand businesses in Vermont. And so um, my hope with uh, becoming Secretary of State is to reach out to some of those newer businesses, the folks who used this system within the last two or three years, whose memory might be fresh, and say, how did it work for you? You know, is there anything that we could do differently? So you not only have legislative experience, you have small business experience. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you're going to combine these two sets of experiences to yeah. this new job if you're elected? 
Yeah. Um, so after I had been in the legislature for five or six years, um, my kids were a little older and I uh, wasn't so much 100% mom in the off sessions. Um, and, uh, and I thought that my hometown needed a coffee shop. And so I opened a little Main Street Cafe, uh, operated that business for 11 years before making way for one of my former employees to open up her own shop in the same space. So we still have good coffee in town. That's really important. Um, but, you know, being a Main Street business owner was really uh, a, such a valuable experience. Um, you know, it's, it's the intensity and ups and downs of the restaurant industry, which is always a challenge in a, in a state that has a lot of sort of seasonal uh, variability in our, in our traffic. Um, uh, but, you know, the experience of uh, needing to make payroll and needing to make sure that I get, you know, that tax filing done on time, was really valuable, and it and what it what it has informed me to uh, to look for and to value is really good customer service on the part of the state agencies that businesses have to interact with. Simple things like reminder emails um, with a link to where you need to go to to log in for that particular certificate renewal or um, or or to pay your monthly tax bill are are just critical conveniences for uh, small business owners who are oftentimes, you know, operating with, you know, very few staff and, and sort of being pulled in a lot of different directions. So good customer service will be at the heart of what, uh, what I ask us to continue to do at the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. So if elected, you'll be transitioning from a part-time citizen legislator with no staff to running multiple divisions with... Mm -hmm. I'm assuming a pretty sizable staff. Uh, is this an exciting challenge for you? So I love the challenge of it. Um, you know, my my kids are out of the house. My I, my business, as I said, I've transitioned um, you know that space into new ownership, and um, so I do have the time on my hands to work year round. And and I really value the role of being responsive to Vermonters and asking Vermonters what's working for you, what's not working for you, what can we do better? Because that's essentially what I've been doing on a part-time basis for 18 years. Now I'll be able to do it on a full-time basis um, with some really tangible places where I think we can um, make improvements and, uh, and ask for information from Vermonters on how to do that. Where do you think we, we need to make priority improvements? Um, so we have some work to do in terms of our um, campaign finance and lobbyist disclosure website. I still remember it probably, probably was um, the web portal was running by the time you got to the legislature. But when I first ran, we had to file with paper filings, you know, in, in the mail. Um, and, and so that system now is aging, you know, it's a decade or more old, and it needs some, uh, some uh, upgrades. Part of the reason we have those systems in place is because Vermonters want to know who's spending money to support candidates in our elections. And, uh, and so I want to make sure that uh, we improve the, uh, the, the participation of candidates because right now, uh, since it is not enforceable, um, some candidates simply choose to not file when they have spent money and, and disclose where that money came from. And that's really frustrating when you're working hard as a House candidate maybe and you're uh, you know, you're asking your, your grandparents for $50 and your neighbors for $25 so that you can afford to, you know, put some lawn signs out or send out a mailer. And you have an opponent who's doing all of those things and you don't know whether that was self-funded, whether it was funded from outside of the state, whether it was funded like, like you've done in, in getting, you know, help from your uh, friends and family. And so we, we could work towards better compliance on campaign finance. Um, I think uh, the conversation around how to do enforcement so that it can be required that people file in the past was always uh, a bit of the Secretary of State's office saying not my job and the Attorney General's office saying not my job. 
And so we have an opportunity now to have that conversation about, uh, about whether with a new incoming attorney general and a new incoming secretary of state, whether we can find a way to, uh, to boost compliance with campaign finance laws. Uh, at the very least, what I will seek to do is what I said before uh, in the business realm, give good customer service in sending a reminder email to all registered candidates with the link that says this is where you need to log in to file your campaign finance report. Sometimes that reminder is enough to prompt people because I know you probably remember scrambling during campaign season and feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to knock on doors, I'm trying to go to community events, and oof, it just slipped my mind that I was supposed to do a campaign finance filing. Um, and so I think, uh, I think we, can, we can get a good way along that path uh, simply by making it easier for people. Mm -hmm. And speaking of elections, uh, given what we're seeing around the country with what appears to be in many areas an attack on the democratic process itself, mm -hmm. how, how healthy is Vermont's democracy? Uh, do you have any concerns uh, or do you think we're doing a good job and we just need to make sure that we have safeguards in place? I think Vermont's democracy is, um, is in a good place, but we have so much more we could do and should do. Um, the, the issue of election security is one that is always uh, top of mind. We need to have a continuous uh, communication loop as we do now, uh, but in the future, continuous uh, exchange of information between the local municipal clerks who are administering the elections and the Secretary of State's office so that we're sharing best practices, so that we are supporting the clerks if they need something in order to make their elections um, more secure and, uh, and streamline their processes on the local level. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that really uh, has bothered me about the strength of democracy in Vermont and I don't know if you ever had this experience, but when I was campaigning for my house seat over the years, so many times I would have a really great conversation with somebody, and I would feel like they were really excited by the issues that I'd been working on and, uh, and, and very supportive, and I'd say, can I count on your vote? And they would say, oh, I don't vote. I don't know any of those people on the ballot, which is a perfectly legitimate reason not to vote. I just happen to think we could do better in, uh, in a state like Vermont where, uh, you know, where neighbors talk to each other and, you know, you know a lot of the people who live in your small community. I think the Secretary of State's office should start to publish um, a, a voter guide so that when you get your November ballot in the mail, you'll also get a postcard with a URL to the website that has all of the candidates listed and an option to order a paper copy because, as you know, many folks around the state of Vermont don't have reliable internet service still in 2022. Yeah. That's an aside. Um, but that voter guide, it, 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 it's mostly information that the Secretary of State's office already gathers when we register to become candidates. They, they get our address, our contact information, our website, our social media. And I would also require candidates to, to give us 100 words why are you running for this office and what will you do if elected? And that way it really jump starts that process for people to, when they have 45 days with their ballot to be able to sit down and, and find the candidate whose values most closely match their own. In that way we can be really inspiring people to participate in democracy. But the other side of your question uh, about the state of democracy more generally uh, really gets more to uh, to a lot of the rhetoric that's been going around about stolen elections and about fraud. And uh, we spent a lot of time in the House Government Operations Committee looking at uh, sort of the landscape around um, election security and voter fraud in Vermont because when we uh, when we were faced during the pandemic with the question of, well, how are we going to operate elections when so many of our poll workers are, you know, the retired postmaster or your retired teachers. 
And these people are not going to want to sit face to face with all of their neighbors for an entire day in order to help us conduct elections. So when we considered moving to universal vote by mail on that emergency basis, we did a lot of kicking of the tires and a lot of asking, you know, what is the landscape in Vermont around election security? And what we believe and what I continue to believe is that our local town clerks are, uh, are really good partners in, in maintaining a secure um, checklist of people who are eligible to vote, uh, of sending out ballots and then checking those ballots back in when somebody returns them, and making sure that nobody is voting twice. And in fact, you know, when we looked at the 2020 election, which was sort of a high watermark in terms of participation, there were, there were seven instances of reported irregularities where, you know, at the end of the night, the town clerk said, huh, I see John P. Smith, uh, you know, was reported uh, as voting or trying to vote twice. And what they recognized after resolving all of those um, irregularities, investigating them, was that many of them, six out of the seven, were instances of, of simple human error. Somebody on the check-in checked John P. Smith instead of John Q. Smith. And so there are, were actually two different John Smiths, and that's why there were two votes. The seventh instance of irregularity um, upon investigation was somebody who was actually testing the system. And he was testing the system in one of our largest municipalities where you might think it would be easier to sort of slip under the radar. Um, but indeed, he had returned his, um, his ballot that had been mailed to him and then showed up on election day and demanded to, uh, to, to have a second ballot. There's a provision uh, in that case uh, because we don't ever want to deny somebody their right to vote. And if it had happened to be a John P. Smith versus John Q. Smith, you wouldn't want John Q. Smith to be denied the right to vote. Um, and so in, in that instance, he signed an affidavit that said, you know, I have not executed my ballot and was given a ballot on Election Day. And then upon investigation, uh, it was found that, indeed, uh, he had executed both of them. I believe he left one of them blank um, in order to uh, not not actually um, uh, have have uh, committed a punishable offense. Uh huh. So um, even though he signed the affidavit, the fact that he didn't fill out one of the ballots, like so, was he was he punished, fined? In those instances, when there are election irregularities, they get referred to the attorney general's office for investigation and um, and then ultimately, you know, a determination of whether a crime was committed. People take their right to vote very seriously. And and so when we look at election security in the state, I, I think the greatest threat to our democracy is that people might mistakenly think that their vote doesn't count because everything's rigged. Mm -hmm. And so my answer to that is we need to do a better job of helping people understand how elections work, how government works more generally, that civics curriculum, because people who know how the black box of government or politics work are less susceptible to the misinformation about stolen elections. And so um, within the Secretary of State's office in the past, there's been an education and outreach coordinator. I would bring back that position, um, and I would have that person help me uh, develop civics curriculum that we can share with our uh, school teachers so that in school kids are learning how elections work. But then I would also ask that person to go out with me on a democracy tour, because we got to recognize that Many adults within our communities never had uh, civics, or if they're my age, maybe they forgot <laughs> some of what they learned back then. Um, but you know, helping people understand uh, how democracy works, how can you be sure? You know, what what do these terms mean when we talk about uh, an affidavit and election security, and uh, you know, and and what are the safeguards that we have in place? Um, and then also. In addition to that, because civics can be kind of dry and boring if all it is is, well, you have three branches of government and the judicial branch does this. and I mean, that's not really very exciting. What I think can be more exciting and more powerful for people is to help them understand how to influence government, right? 
So if you have a challenge, maybe maybe you and many of your peers and folks in your neighborhood are all experiencing the similar challenge. How do you band together? How do you uh, reach out to your elected officials? And how do you ask them to help figure out how to either get out of the way or make government fix the problem? So that whether what your concern is is, is that you can't find a living wage job or, or you're struggling under student debt or childcare is not reliable in your area, or maybe you just can't find affordable housing within a reasonable distance from your job. Any of those challenges are ones that people can and should be asking their legislators and their governor to work on. And I, I think it would be really valuable to help people know how to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't really appreciate how much influence they do have and how accessible Vermont legislators are. If you get if you get three or four uh, emails from constituents and another couple of phone calls, that is a landslide of voter contact and uh, and constituent contact asking you to work on something. And so, you're right. I don't think that people realize that if you banded together with a half a dozen or a dozen people who have the similar challenge, uh, that you could do a lot in terms of getting the attention of your elected officials. Well, I love the idea of the state sending out a list of all the candidates to all voters. I think that's a fantastic idea. Is that something that you could do on your own, or would you need legis legislative approval to do that? So um, if I am elected, I'll be sworn in in January, and that gives me just under two years to figure out how to put together a voter guide. Um, I suspect that we will want to ask for a small appropriation to help with the printing costs because we want to make sure that we can make this available to uh, folks even if they don't have access to, um, to a, a computer to look up the, the website. Um, the, the part about local papers doing voter guides um, that I think will be slightly different than what we're going to try to do is we're going to require that that people fill out, uh, you know, that that information. We already collect most of it, and that hundred-word blurb of, you know, who you are and why you're running, is one that we would require. And in that way, I hope that it would be a universal coverage of all of the candidates who are on your ballot, as opposed to your local paper, who, you know, if if you know. Joe Smith, who's running for um, state representative doesn't take the time to answer the questionnaire from the local paper, then that candidate's not going to be listed. I think for voters, uh, they see a D or an R, they can make some assumptions about where those folks stand on certain issues. Independence, uh, some of the other lesser known parties. Right. If you don't know the person, you just see like an I, you're not going to have any idea where they stand. They could be a fringe lunatic or they, they could share many of the same values that you do. Right. So you're running as a Democrat. Uh, I know from my experience in the House that things are a little different in Vermont. Republicans and Democrats get along to a, to a greater degree than in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. uh, we have pretty civil dialogue and, and debate. Mm -hmm. are, are, you, are you worried about this growing partisan divide taking hold in Vermont and making it a lot harder to run government efficiently? I, you know, I do worry about that, I, but I also have a lot of hope because um, in Vermont we, we seem to have a, a, a fairly robust culture of, you know, live and let live. I'll do my political activism, you do yours, but, but we'll, you know, we're still neighbors. And, um, and I think what we all need to be reminded of as we look at how divisive and, and, and how contentious things have gotten in Washington, D.C. and in other places around the country, uh, what we have to remember is that we don't solve these problems unless we turn towards each other and talk across the aisle about how to solve the problems. You know, one person's um, ideology is not right or wrong. We have to actually come to uh, a, a solution together. I think where other states have gotten tripped up is uh, is in people's refusal to um, to do anything 
if I can't get what I want. And this sort of, um, you know, if I can't win, then I'm going to make sure you don't. We don't have that culture in Vermont. Um, and in Vermont, we, we pass a budget every year. Um, that, that budget is passed not by people stalemating back into their own corners and saying, well, I'm not going to... I'm not going to agree to vote for this if it doesn't contain what my party wants. We come together, and in fact, you know, you remember this from serving in the House. Oftentimes, the the budget comes out of the Appropriations Committee on an 11 to 0 vote and passes on the floor of the House with, you know, less than a handful of no votes because the budget has been worked through uh, with input from both parties, and uh, you know, we've been able to to work through those differences and. And I, I hope that Vermonters will continue to agree that we can solve things better when we all come together around the table. What are some things from your experience in the House that you are most proud of? Maybe some things, uh, some, if you have any unfinished business, and how would that experience inform your role as Secretary of State? Well, I think back to a couple of um, projects that I worked on uh, back in the 2017-2018 time frame. Um, uh, I learned back then that, uh, that first responders who, um, who are injured with a post-traumatic stress injury on the job were not able to get coverage through workers' comp. You know, if they broke their ankle or had smoke inhalation or a burn from from responding to a, a tragic accident. That, of course, those physical injuries were covered, but the mental health injuries of post-traumatic stress were not being covered. And so I was really proud to uh, have worked through the passage of a bill that requires that for first responders. And, um, and that's an area where I think there are, it probably is some other unfinished business because there are, um, there are dozens of other professions where uh, where people are routinely leaving the profession because of work-related uh, trauma and stress. And, uh, you know, if we, if we need people to be able to be there for us on our hardest days, or if we need people like teachers to be able to be in our schools with kids who are experiencing the, the biggest emotional stresses, we need to support those professionals um, in, in being able to recover from the trauma that, that comes from uh, responding to those kinds of um, needs. So that's, a, that's an area that is both a, uh, something that I'm proud of, but also sort of a work in progress um, to continue that conversation. Also in that time frame was the Me Too moment, where um, in Vermont and across the country, Many women were coming forward and telling their stories about harassment in the workplace. I told my own story at that time of being a you know a, a young mom, thirty something legislator, and 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 being harassed uh, by an older colleague in the building. Uh, in that moment of enough is enough, and like we just want to be able to do our job and go to work and not have to worry about looking over our shoulders. Um, Vermont passed what's called, what has been called uh, some of the strongest sexual harassment legislation in the nation. And we passed that nearly unanimously, which is a, a testament, again, to this ability for Vermonters to come and work across the table. So I worked uh, as, at that point, the, the former Democratic majority leader. I worked with um, my Republican minority leader and my progressive minority leader, and the three of us co-sponsored this bill. And, uh, and I'm really proud of that work. And yes, that work is also <laughs> unfinished. You know, we have more work to do to make sure that we are laying the expectation that somebody should be able to go to work, do their job, get a paycheck, go home, and not have to worry about being harassed at work. Um, and I, I guess the last answer to the question of what am I proud of is, uh, is in the climate realm. Um, I, uh, took over the Climate Solutions Caucus. Uh, Senator Pearson and I co-chaired the caucus. Um, and, and during that time period, we really brought the group together um, in a way that helped to focus and streamline our efforts around what do we need to do right now to get Vermont on track to meet our greenhouse emissions reduction goals. Um, and so we, uh, we 
embarked on a strategy of going out and reaching out to Vermonters, going to 20 different uh, communities and holding town hall style meetings to hear feedback from Vermonters. And then through that, uh, that engagement, we were able to pass the Global Warming Solutions Act. And that established the Climate Council, um, who are in the process of, uh, of making recommendations and reviewing uh, our progress towards meeting our goals. Um, and, and the Global Warming Solutions Act, I think, is, is foundational to what we need to do because it sets those goals into statute as requirements and gives Vermonters a way to compel state government to get it done if, for whatever reason, the politics of the moment made it difficult to pass it in bill form, Vermonters can then take, uh, take a route through the courts to say, no, you need to go back to the drawing board. Um, climate is hard. And you know, adapting to new ways of, of getting ourselves around and heating our homes and buildings is a, is a, 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 a challenge for a lot of Vermonters. But these are things that we can do when we come together, when we look at new technologies, when we help uh, remove some of the barriers to being able to heat your home with a renewable energy source or get to work and, and uh, in school you know, with a vehicle that's powered on renewable energy. Um, and I'm excited about the progress we've made, but of course it is a work in progress and we have so much more we need to do and so little time to do it. Well, Sarah, thank you for your years of service to the state of Vermont. Uh, how can Woodstock voters and voters around the region learn more about you? I would love to invite people to visit my website, uh, sarahforvermont.com. Um, and if they happen to be on social media, my social media handles are at sarah4vermont with the number four. Okay. Um, and would love to have people follow. They can... Uh, you know, sign up to get on the mailing list if they'd like to hear updates, and always reach out because um, you know I'm always looking for information about how we're doing and what we can do better, and would love to hear from folks around Woodstock. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your views with the viewers of Woodstock Community Television, and best of luck out on the campaign trail. Thank you so much.